Thank you. So I think <coughs> for those of you that didn't follow the last season, we have a really wonderful short video that we're going to have a look at that gives a documentation of the Cosmos season number one. And Grad, do you want to say anything before we start this? Well, it, it's it's a video w which really does the retrospective of 2015, the season 2015 to 2016. And it was done by Patricia Batera, and I'm very happy to present it now. And uh, we can just show it to start. Yeah, can we start the video? We can also take our They see you, and the first thing that crosses their mind is to check where is she from? What about your parents? Where are they from? And they go, oh, no, 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 no. But you cannot be German. You don't look German. Pointing at my skin. One is black or German. Not black and German. <laughs> I don't think that you are black. And she said that in a way as if she was doing me a favor. and to transform this concept of knowledge is only possible if you transform also the configurations of power and one is related to other. And that's what we're going to do in this cosmos. Why do you write? I write to, uh, to stop myself going crazy, but I'm not sure it's working. Any single piece of word you utter, it will never be erased. It's a guard of a temple. This is uh, belong to Mesopotamia uh, period, Ashur and Babylon. The original thing, it's engraving. But I did it on textile <laughs> and embroidery. And for them, it was great expression what they meant for those who could interpret the Mesopotamia writings. It is still very difficult for marginalized groups to enter in literature and to publish. If you punish one, punish him with a, with, with a hand from Mitalia, yeah, right? When the hit comes, it really hurts. A small moment of weakness follows. The pained body briefly appeals to my will, please make it stop, it's not good. During enslavement and during the colonization, African names were often forbidden, they were erased, and we could not carry them. When I recalled my name Patras or Petros, which is a Greek name, which I, it comes from Europe, and today I am in Europe, but I am not seen as a human. Is the German government violating our human rights? By keeping us in the lagers. You know, it's isolated. Living for six years in such a, an environment is, first of all, the children lose um, confidence to mix with the society. This is why um, I personally got involved in this fight because I realized that I would like to change something. You leave the lager, you leave the camps where you are forced to be. You have no free of movement. What was the, the, the intention of, of this boat tour? We are an organized um, refugee group, women group, and um, we know we are the ones who can talk about ourselves better. We are the ones who can bring our problems out better. Uh, but what was uh, very impressive is that Women just move. They get the courage to do something because when somebody gives you something and you don't say anything, they assume silence means you're okay. Who's different here in this room? Am I different from you? Or you? Why didn't you simply go to the microphone and take it to say something? Listening is in the sense 
the act of authorization towards the speaker. So to say, as listener, you have, you give me the authorization to become the speaking subject. At that time, I knew that the film can have some problems. I was told that I could not shoot, but I just take some part out just to have the permission. And uh, after that, I put, I put back again what I, I moved before, because if I just continue to shoot one by one, I, I will just tell to the people what they wanted me to say. I realized that there was not enough support given to the arts. Artists were not taken seriously in their communities. Many people mistrusted this kind of work. To make my profession more visible, I decided to give my best piece to the president of Uganda himself. In my country, if we want someone to do something, we give presents and compliments to that person. D, little d, democracy. The würde des Menschen is unabhängbar. Sie zu achten und zu schützen, ist Verpflichtung aller staatlichen Gewalt. Was ist mit den Abgeschobenen, Frau Merkel? Das sind auch Roma, die wollen hier bleiben. Das sind auch Individuen und die, für die zählt auch Artikel 1. Das war die Eröffnung des Memorials of the European Sinti and Roma. Yeah, here in Berlin. It was not the right place, but I think I don't see Merkel every day, so <laughs> it was just one possibility for me to interrupt and to ask. The 2nd of August, this is the, the day of the Roma Holocaust. There was, of course, a Zigeunerlager in Auschwitz, mm. but uh, more or the half of these people was killed in the wood, on the streets, or everywhere, and the people didn't have the papers. Tak byli zabiti a umlácení malí děti, ženy, znásilňovány. Nám komunistická vláda v roce 71 postavila velkou vykrmnu ve pšů. We want a European Union who is equal for all of us. But you see, uh, the Roma day, they create 71, and the pig farm, they create also 71. And this is built also with European money. Racism has been at the very center of European politics since 500 years, starting with the European project of slavery, the European project of colonization, and nowadays the European project of the fortress Europe. We see it now as that is really the margins that question the mm. politics of the center and transform mm. it. But maybe things I cannot um, talk openly in the streets, maybe, because, you know, the situation is in, 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 in Syria, uh, so I just change it to a song and sing it. And I said, in, in, in the corners of my city, you see some people are dealing, and the other way, the other street, if you just go over the corner, you will see someone try to kill somebody to get their phone or money from him and so on. So the whole country is out of control. Il faut quitter le chimpanzés. Well, I wanted to make a film about uh, abstract concept of violence. Please eat up the salmon for lunch. Don't watch the corpse and the children with ripped out fingernails on YouTube before lunch. You don't want to lose your appetite for salmon. It took a little bit of time to find the mutual language between us. The base thing was in the body language. <laughs> Das. 
objects are looked at, subjects can look. And this was really uh, politically very important already during the slavery time. It was a very clear rule for um, enslaved Africans uh, who were not supposed to be subjects and they could not look at, look and r raise the head and show the eyes and show that he's observing and he's looking at. And that was a very important moment. Until the 50s, it was common to lynch black people when they dared to look uh, in the eyes because this look means uh, being a subject. <laughs> I wanted to show that, okay, I'm visible now, I'm here, just to prove yourself in a strong way also. You need to be strong in this situation. And the video starts that I finish my performance and then I'm going backstage. And even when you, you go and I want to rest and the eyes are still is like looking at you. So I had to cross the border to, to just start in a, in a new country where I can prove myself. So I have to present for the new country that my spirit was covered and my country was covered in black. Because the black, it's, it's uh, the mentality of uh, our community in the Middle East maybe and everything around us and the view of the people. <laughs> We really have to change this vision of the margins that is not that place only of loss and, and disappointment and misery. Normally, it's as, as a Palestinians, you need to be like kind of fighters or, or Israeli. You, you need to be in this, in this position. All, all the question, if I say where I come from, it's normally coming to the political issue and about the conflict. And I'm trying all. Uh, I'm trying to be myself as an artist, not to be as as a fighter. The metal, it's it's known. It's a heavy material. I did it like a, like a sh uh, like a shoes. You cannot really walk, uh, and nobody have the key. But in my in my in my, in my experience, after I left to Europe, I, I feel uh, actually I can get out of, of of this exhibition. It's like this shoes. It's like you cannot walk in it, and you cannot do anything with it. But you always have a possibility to take your foot out. We find ourselves working in our houses, our bedrooms, our kitchen, our beds. You're not even free in your own country to find a space to work. And you want to also to diffuse your work all over the world. You have to prove that you are rich and you are important. I don't need your space. I don't need your visa. I would like just to work with some artists in one meter, one square meter. And I can do just take this table and you work in it. Yeah, she was playing with the photos a little bit like just reviewing what happened this year. But in the process of the rehearsal, we understood just it's like it happened a lot in the year, just we ignore, just it comes and then go, the other one comes and go. After a while, we forget like what happened. How much risk are you taking to show your work? When you dance, it's, it's not really separate of your body. Then the body has some experience. Um, you are dancing, your experience. Like, um, it is political. You can't be unpolitically on the stage. My father and my mother are Muslims. So I decided to work on this, uh, on this uh, topic, which is uh, wh what is the trace that a religious education can leave on, uh, on human body? For me, uh, I don't believe in in, in the idea of me and my body. I don't have a body, I am a body. The red, uh, as you can see, is uh, after painting, he, like a person, goes in a, in a trance movement in a very hard and not aggressive, but really uh, poetic trance. I'm trying to convince him that maybe we should go further and think uh, more openly. And he's painting me and I'm trying to to clean him, so I, I, I just that don't because I can't. The education is like this. Is I have something in me which is still Muslim. So fast to go, you cannot get it. You cannot reach 
The message always reaches its destination. For me, that this is fascinating because uh, it's no matter what the address you write, it's no matter what you want, where the letter arrives, this is the destination. This is like uh, the life after when you die and somebody, yeah, your soul is entered to uh, another body. It's a circle. They call it circle of re resurrection. Or it represents this immortality. Uh, yeah, but now mm. it's more like art or folklore. In Syria, they used to believe in this. <laughs> That's what we did last yeah. season. And I want to thank Patricia Bataira. If you are here, just yes. say hello. Thank you so much for your brilliant work. It was beautiful. <laughs> I think this is, can we start the slideshow now? Because now we will start really with the, um, the part two of the evening. And this is where we look at basically Grada Colomba and her practice, because I think the Cosmo, her curating this series mm -hmm. of events at Cosmo is a part of her practice. And I'm just, look, she has, we're going to be talking about her work, which is des the Desire Project, which was just um, presented and is still going on at the uh, Sao Paulo Biennale in Brazil. And I really like uh, this little biography. I think <laughs> because most of you are familiar with Grada, uh, Grada Colomba is a writer, theorist, and artist who activates and produces decolonial, <laughs> decolonial knowledge by weaving relationships between gender, race, and class. Her, her avoir, <laughs> avoir <laughs> consists of different formats and registers, such as publications, stage readings, lecture performances, video installations, and theoretical texts, creating a hybrid space between academic knowledge and artistic practice. From the dual gesture of decolonizing thought and performing knowledge, Colomba leaps from text to performance and gives body, voice, and image to her writings. And the Desire Project is what we're going to be looking at. Can, could we start the slideshow? Mm. Is it? Huh. <laughs> 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 and I think maybe, like, because we will run a series of slides that are going to start very quickly. <laughs> And maybe, I, because at least what I would like to speak about with Garada this evening is going with the Desire Project is looking at how her body of work has emerged, how the work um, from uh, her like writing. Sorry, I, we should see the slideshows yeah. and this is one of the videos maybe. Yes. We, okay. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh. We can make it really slow. Oh, no, nope, that's... <laughs> um, Actually, first we informed that we were going to, to do present or give a preview of mm -hmm. Illusions, which is the second project I'm presenting at the Biennale of Sao Paulo. But there was some technical delay, so we can actually not show it yet. So a week ago, when I just arrived, I spoke with Ned Shati and with Diana, and we said, let's instead talk about this desire project that just opened last week uh, in Sao Paulo at the Biennale. And 
that's why we change suddenly um, the content of today. But I think it's a, a great way to open mm -hmm. this season because it has a lot to do with what we've been doing. Yeah, and I think what like we're going to see now is a series of videos that uh, Grada, a series of images that Grada took while she was preparing the work in Sao Paulo. And we'll see later than the uh, three. They're oh. already running, Good. right? These are just some images of uh, Sao Paulo in general, which is like a jungle of stone, a selva de pedra. And this is the, the park where actually the pavilion from the Biennale is, um, the Parque Ibirapuera. And inside, uh, the, the pavilion of the Biennale is there, which is one the second most important Biennale of the world, but also the Afro-Brazilian um, Museum. So it's, uh, it's located a lot of uh, very important spaces inside this park. And this is actually the s some images that I just did with my own phone um, to have an idea of what the pavilion is. It's, uh, hundreds of, of meters of two exhibition. Um, and um, and what we said that we're going to talk about is how we constructed actually the, the installation. And um, the installation has two different moments and one moment where we build an architecture that is really like a black box where the films are being shown. And um, this was the first, when I arrived there, this is what they had prepared, and then I really had to build up after the architecture was done. Um, we s moved the screens and we closed, we had to close some walls and etc. that's part of the work, until you find the, f the, the right um, cocoon to, 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 to do the work. Um, and then what we were going to talk about is the, the work and the installation has two different moments. One moment is the, um, uh, the environment to the installation and then you get inside um, the installation itself. And in this environment, I, I wanted to do first an altar to the Orishas and especially to Shkrava Nastasi, who's, who's an entity who has been inspiring me a lot in my work and bringing the issues of of silencing and speaking and narratives. So I walked around the old São Paulo by foot, I <laughs> swear, and I went to <laughs> all these. Can we just make a, 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 a pause shortly now? Is it possible? And then we continue? Don't so. You don't think so? <laughs> um, and I went to the uh, Casa of Orishas, which are the, the houses of the African gods, and, um, and started collecting all these different elements uh, to build this altar in front of the video installation. And I like this hybridity that you have this very spiritual dimension of the work, and also this knowledge, where knowledge comes from, and this spirituality and emotionality that is being presented at the beginning, and this ancestors also, this dedication to the ancestors. And then you get inside the installation and you have a very technological and very digital um, work uh, inside uh, with the drumming and the beating of a bit, uh, drummings to call the ancestors. This was after the shopping I started collecting and putting the things outside. This is dedicated to the Orishas that are related to Oshala, which is the Orisha, the god that, um, that is this entity is connected with. Um, Shkrava Nastasi was a woman who was incarcerated in a mask um, uh, and brings, raises for me all these questions of who can speak and what happens if we, our mouth is not sealed and what has to be listened to. And, and there's this story of having a, a coffee, she drinks coffee and, and smokes a kashimbo and the beads that are related to the, uh, this Odisha. So this all was built in front. And then I bought, I went to these houses um, dozens of times and I was buying, uh, I don't know, dozens of candles. And we also put it so that uh, actually the, 
the audience, the people who are visiting the Biennale, can actually put their own a candle in front of this entity it was quite beautiful. Um, so basically, this is what these images were showing, but we can talk about it. But this was the journey inside Sao Paulo to leave this uh, arts pavilion and then really go more to the periphery and searching for the houses and speaking with the owners of the houses and collecting all the, all the necessary goods to build this altar. And I like this, this contrast. Um, I think it's really important to, to work with this contrast. So um, this is how I started and then we built it. This was like some days before the opening. I think yeah. what's, what's interesting is that the work that you show is so much driven by, I mean, the way that you work is actually driven by this um, culture of Orisha resistance, mm -hmm. uh, resistant Orishas. And that it's different when you show the work in Sao Paulo because you do have this whole culture that actually is connected with Orishas and that you actually can go to, like you find many shops where you can get these objects. But it also means that for the public that goes into the Biennale, many, many people know what these things are. Absolutely. And Absolutely, yeah. that is true. Um, it is for me, I think, it, I, I think it's quite fascinating because depending of the context where you show your work, the work is like the work has an, a new narrative. Um, just before this Biennale of Sao Paulo, uh, I, I was just showing a similar work in Johannesburg uh, with a, a, a city who has a history of apartheid that is still so alive and it has um, a very strong movement. And, and it's really fascinating that this South-South encounter, what happens when uh, black artists, um, people from the African diaspora or for other, from other diasporas, go back to the South and work in the South context and suddenly the work becomes really explosive because it's, it, it becomes alive in a different way because the meaning is so strong. It has more than a double meaning. It, it receives meanings that you didn't see before. And that's what I have been experiencing in, in, in these journeys that I feel very blessed and lucky um, to be invited to all these different um, venues and spaces uh, and, and, and suddenly to show the work in a different context mm -hmm. where the political and the religions and the social context is a different one. And then suddenly the work has a totally different meaning and awakes perspectives and images that I never saw before. Um, and in Sao Paulo it was exactly the same that um, there was a very strong connection and the work became very urgent. It has a different urgency. Um, I think in, e in Europe is important and interesting, but we have this privilege of not having to deal with it if we don't want. But when you go to South, it is an existential need. It's a very urgent need to deal with this kind mm -hmm. of work. So it, it, it becomes so, um, it, it has a different meaning. Yeah, and I think, yeah, yeah. This, I mean that you build this small altar before entering and it's a three channel video installation. And it's, I think, one of the things, because you're also messing with the format of a video installation, and I think it's important because part of the project of you becoming an artist is that you've been producing different types of knowledge that is about decolonizing knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's basically your practice, and that goes as a, like, basically as a writer, as an academic, as an activist, as a philosopher, doing all of these different things that you've been building up towards this and mm -hmm. experimenting with different formats. But actually then you're, and I think now you've sort of like ended up becoming an artist. And what makes the art the art is that you're actually um, like not sticking to the boundaries of what it means to do a three channel video installation. And then suddenly it's like, okay, we actually need this, this uh, altar, which would play a completely different role if the, ex if the show was done in Berlin at the Biennale or in Documenta, mm, mm. you can still have an altar, but it won't have the same engagement with the public, and you would have a very different experience go looking for those shops. Absolutely, that is true. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's been really a journey. I, I'm, I'm, I'm always in a kind of identity crisis in that sense, because um, 
there's always this difficulty to place myself in what you are, uh, what do you do? And um, I think exactly because of I intend indeed to cross these different disciplines, I think it's really very important to cross these different, to go beyond these disciplines. I think the disciplines are very segmented and very fragmented and uh, you are supposed to be this and you cannot do this. And uh, to do that work, you have to study that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the disciplines are very, very uh, fragmented. And um, I think this fragmentation is, this segmentation is really part of this colonial knowledge production mm -hmm. uh, where uh, everything is separated where uh, there's this hierarchization of the, the person who speaks and speaks about the other and mm -hmm. creates the other and creates an object that they describe and talk about and can control and can name and classify and, and in the name of science and in the name of, of objectivity and in the name of the universal. And to break down these this, this, uh, borders. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very much part of decolonizing knowledge. That's, I think, when the work becomes so hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, that's maybe why I've been crossing through disciplines. Uh, I don't care so much about it. What for me is important is to tell a story. Mm -hmm. I usually have a story that I want to tell and then I try to find the way to tell it, which can take f different formats. Yeah. I think it's more about that. But I, and mm. I think it's important to understand that, I mean, like, okay, we are in a quite standard format here tonight, but actually it's not when you look at the whole body of work that Cosmos has produced, that mm. it's actually going really outside of a standard sort of lecture series, and mm. especially not typical for Berlin. And I think it's important for me to sort of highlight that in your work, that you're challenging formats as a form of colonization. And that by rethinking how we do what we do, rethinking the mm. format is already part of how we decolonize knowledge and how we decolonize the production of knowledge. Oh yeah, absolutely, I right. think so. Yeah. Do you know, I think we should look at the first video. Should we? Yeah, there's... Already? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there are th okay. What we're going to do is we're going to look at each of the three videos that are shown in the, in the video installation they're all quite short, but we're going to look at one and then we will have a few, speak about it a bit okay. and we will take a few questions from the audience if you're interested. And yeah. Should we start one by one? Yeah, let's, yeah, we do one by one. So yes. maybe I can uh, shortly explain. This is, was really a project that started in 2015 wa with a video while I write. And then uh, that was the first video I did and the only one. <laughs> um, and, and then this while I write, um, was first show, it was then shown in Rio, was shown at the Biennale in Finland, and so, and I wanted to extend because while I write was just the first part of a project that I imagined, um, but that I didn't have the capacity to do it. Uh, then the Biennale invited me and wanted me to do two projects to the Biennale of São Paulo, and then I could finally extend this project and this project is actually called the desire project and it's a uh, um it's told in three acts and while i write is one of the acts so i had the chance to write the two other acts and and we build it in a way that um so we are now having a, a talk which is not a video installation but i find it interesting then to talk how how we build a scenario how we stage a video so that it can narrate a certain story. And what we did, we built a black box in a triangle form, so to say, so that we enter and you are surrounded by three uh, walls and you sit at the center and you can decide to which um, side you want to look at. But the three videos are um, f playing at the same time with one single music by Moses Leo, who did who, the music and the drumming, we worked together, and you have only this music for all the three videos, and they are running at the same time. Um, so you have one, two, three acts, 
but at the same time, you can also look at the three images at the same time, which constructs a third uh, text. Um, and this is something that we cannot experience here, but we can take a look at some of the videos and then talk about it, how we did it. We, we start with the yeah. first. We start with the first, which is While I Walk. While I Walk. This is why I want. <coughs> so I, I get, I think the sound is very important. The sound is, um, it seems like somebody touched the sound. Maybe in the next videos, maybe we can change it back to original or make it louder. Something was not working. But I think then if we do the um, after the, the streaming, we have the originals and we yeah. can watch it again. But this, this was the first act. I think this, mm. is, this is, I mean, it follows very much from what you're talking about, but the, I think what's important, oops, and what you're talking about is that there is no, there is no body. These words mm. have time to resonate. There is no voice. And this is something we, that you've s talked about a lot is what, where is the body in this? and that it allows this question of who is different from what to really become very, very strong. Mm. And maybe mm. you want to speak about this a little bit, which is how, how you're using the text to build a narrative, but how the narrative uh, functions without, basically, uh, without a performer. Yes, it's, it's, it's um, well, I, I think in this work, like, when I, I wanted to do something very experimental. I think I work uh, very experimental in this sense, and I wanted to. I'm very fascinated with the 
the traditional African traditional storytelling and this idea of producing knowledge and through narrative, through oral narrative by telling stories. Um, and this a tradition of storytelling embodies so many elements of knowledge production that um, we actually do not practice uh, nowadays, like the spirituality, these elements of spirituality, of body, of physicality, uh, of memory, of trauma, of, of desire, of hope, uh, of a vision, of projection, of... Uh, there's so many elements that we have been missing in this knowledge production. And I like this very... I like this idea, idea of going back to the storytelling and restage it now in contemporary spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and so my idea was really to tell these stories, uh, to tell, some, tell something, and to tell this something, and instead of having a voice, a person speaking, having the drums speaking. So I like this undoing of artistic practices, that you don't have a voice um, to tell a story, but it is the drumming that is speaking with you and with the words. And instead of having a physical person or um, to have the words becoming the body of the video work. And, uh, and I like this contrast. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was, for me, really always this experiment to contradict the usual formats of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of artistic practices and to see how it works, how it works. I wanted very much to focus on what the text says. And actually, even though our words and the design of words, you can physically and emotionally uh, begleiten, a, comp a companion, mm -hmm. uh, what is being said. And you, are a compa uh, you have the company of the drumming as well. Um, the drumming uh, is a drumming to call the ancestors. It's calling. It starts with uh, voices. We did some recording of, um, of voices, voice over in public spaces. Uh, to play with this idea that uh, the voices are louder and you cannot actually have a voice, but then the drumming that speaks your voice becomes louder and the other voices disappear and play with this speaking and silencing and this, as Patricia Batera put uh, also in the video, um, this becoming the speaking subject by having the authorization to speak when the voices go down and become silent and allowed a space for marginalized voices, voices which were silenced finally to speak. And this is what this work is playing with very much. Yeah. And I think everybody who's, who's marginalized can relate to this work very, very easily. But I'm also thinking that like, in a way you could also do something where you are in a camera or somebody speaks the words and says, and it wouldn't like it could be you, it could be a white woman or a white man. It, it wouldn't really m matter. But suddenly, when you have a person and a figure to identify these words with, it already starts to act out what the words are describing in a way that they're unacting. Mm. And so, as soon as you have somebody, or even a voice, because you can attach all kinds of speculative ideas about what kind of per person has that voice, speaks with that voice. And here, it's very open because it allows a lot of space to question like what it means to, to, to be that body walking and to be that difference. Mm. I, I think also I like to, to, uh, to work with, um, with, to go to these uncomfortable zones. And I think when we work with these uncomfortable moments or, or moment, moments that we cannot really understand, I think that's what the artistic work is for, mm -hmm. is to give response or you create a space through arts to have an answer to something that you don't understand or to something that hurts or something that is causing you pain and confusion. And that's also, that's what creativity is for. You're searching for, you're trying to puzzle uh, that pain to understand or to unpack. I think it's very much about that. So there's a mom, uh, an element of vulnerability. And I think that when there's this element of an vulnerability, of honesty, I think then it's possible for any audience, 
independently mm -hmm. of their biography mm -hmm. to identify with and to have a sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. And I think this is when, for instance, arts um, is possible to do that. Mm -hmm. I think in the academia, then it's not possible. That's th I, I think that's, that's when, for instance, I started personally to decide to leave certain spaces. Mm -hmm. I started, for instance, to realize that it's absolutely useless to teach at university. <laughs> it's absolutely useless. You can applaud, you can applaud that. You can <laughs> applaud. <laughs> I, I, I really think um, it, it's extremely exhausting and, and it's completely useless. I, I, I started, we, we are here, we've been saying this so many times, we are here at the Maxim Gorky Theater where Umbold, uh, Alexander von Humboldt used to do his famous lectures of Cosmos, that's why it is called Cosmos Square or Zwei because we want to occupy this space in you. And he used to do his lectures of his colonial journeys exactly in this space. We are surrounded by the Humboldt Forum, the Humboldt University, and so on. I started lecturing at the Humboldt University Gender Studies in 2004. Um, and I do not see, and I, I find it absolutely useless uh, to teach at the university. I think that's also why many of us decide to leave and instead to do their own work. And I think, because when you are at university, you become a beamta, you become mm -hmm. a, a bureaucrat that sign papers and write uh, recommendations, but also um, you're struggling against the system that is immense and hostile, and you cannot really change that system. Um, and I realize when you do your own work outside academia, uh, you become much more influential and transformative than inside academia. You can really, through your work, transform. Um, that's why I say I, I think it's really useless to be inside. It, it doesn't really transform in that sense. But then I'm, uh, I'm going to actually say yes. I, yeah, one thing is, I think this is a great way to move into the next piece, which is while I speak. While I speak, it's a good one. But should can no, we no. regulate the sound, please? Ah or put it louder and clear. I don't know why that happened. It okay. would be great. <laughs> and questions or comments from the audience? Sorry, we're going to skip them to the next round, OK? Because yeah, we'll do it in yeah. the next round. <laughs> <laughs>
So the most obvious thing that, that first struck me is that here you shift from the I to a we and a they. And maybe can you comment on that? Well, it speaks exactly about this encountering a whole colonial dichotomy uh, that uh, when you speak, um, then you become a representative of a group and you become excluded from the we or and and you always put in this dichotomy. Um, so I wanted to start first with this while I walk, uh, mm -hmm. with these different elements, uh, different moments um, of not being able to speak or come to voice, which is starts with this pointing and, 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 and naming the difference and associating this difference with the hierarchy, mm -hmm. with the pathology, with the problem, uh, with the exoticism, with the fascination, whatever it is. Um, but that place you outside yourself or doesn't give you the possibility of being yourself. And, and as soon as you start speaking, um, you f see yourself imprisoned in this old dichotomy that you f it feels like you cannot escape where suddenly we, I am we, and mm -hmm. we are a collective of people who cannot obviously apparently come to voice and to play with that. For me, it was very important. Like in other projects, in previous uh, projects, it was very important for me to have the, uh, to speak in the first person and um, to tell the story from a very subjective uh, starting point, from a narrative, um, not to speak, uh, in the name of someone else, or to give a name to someone else, but um, always to use this from mm -hmm. where from where am I speaking, and from which place in time am I speaking, and why am I saying that? So this is how this one came um, as the second act before before the last one. Yeah. Because I think when you like in the first while I walk, and that there's the point that is raised. I am not dis I am dis I am not discriminated against because I'm different. I am different because I'm discriminated. I become different exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that this is this is actually exactly that moment where you we are rendered into we and not I in this moment when that collective experience counts, but mm -hmm. it's also a collective knowledge, but it also gets reduced to something else. Mm -hmm. And I think every like anyway everybody knows what this is like to no longer be able to say and be heard. And you come, you can come with a very reasonable argument, such as, like, no, I'm being discriminated against. I'm not different. Mm -hmm. This is discrimination. And that's mm -hmm. what makes someone else think that I'm different. And that that's the moment when you cannot speak. And it doesn't matter how rational and fact-filled your argument is, as long as that other side is, like, perceiving a difference that has already decided that your argument is going to be emotional and not fact-based. and experience-based maybe, right. but still that's going to be less, that's going to count less than actual knowledge. And it's very interesting because uh, w when I showed that last week at, at, at the Biennale in Sao Paulo, then it, uh, the Biennale opened like two, three days after the official impeachment against uh, Dilma Rousseff, who was the first woman being in power as a president in Brazil and who was um, taken from power by uh, a man who uh, created a parliament, an entire parliament with other white men in in Brazil, and um, and the argument is has been that Dilma has a history of corruption, knowing that the man who came to power as well um, ha has a curriculum of corrup uh, corruption as well. So um, it's, I find it very interesting because then the work that we do when we place it in different contexts then have a different, uh, a different meaning. And um, in this context, it was very important, it's very important for many different biographies and for many movements. I think, for instance, in the Biennale, I think it was the first Biennale that had so many indigenous Brazilian artists present. It was the first time that uh, um, so many black artists were present, black queer artists were present, and curators. 
um, it was a big change in the in the configuration of power, and it was the first time that so there were mere, uh, more uh, women artists um, in, uh, exhibiting the work than than male uh, artists, which was really a change of configuration mm -hmm. um, of, of, of power. Um, so suddenly there was a, a different, a new narrative mm -hmm. um, that usually, I think it has been happening, but this year was um, more radical, I believe. Um, and and uh, and then all these narratives, all these different acts, then have uh, also another dimension because suddenly many people that uh, sometimes don't have access to such a, a prominent space mm -hmm. like this um, can make themselves visible. I think also going back to the beginning of our conversation, when I say I make a video installation and I do not reduce the video installation to the screening and to the projection of the video work, but I do, for instance, bring the elements of the ancestors and of memory and of the Odishas as the environment to enter this installation is also another moment where suddenly you bring objects and you bring a certain knowledge that usually do not have a place in the art spaces. Uh, in art spaces, this kind of knowledge, this kind of, of objects, this kind of, 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 uh, of aesthetic does not belong there. And there was many of these hybrid mm -hmm. moments there, uh, which I find very important. And this is for me really mm -hmm. what decolonizing knowledge is. When, when um, you know, these new uh, configurations of power, these new biographies enter these spaces, bring another bagage, another, an another other elements that usually do not enter these spaces. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then this can also have double, three, four times other meanings. Yeah. But it's, I, I think I it's think very it important because <coughs> like in, an, in a white art world that, that is changing slowly internationally, but even years ago, something like this, like having a, no, like building up this small altar would then maybe be appreciated, but would also then be called uh, folkloristic or something like this. But it would also rely on a white audience, and it would assume a white audience. Mm -hmm. And I think where you're in Brazil, actually, when you have a lot of black artists and a lot of women artists and a lot of like a mixed curatorial team, you actually start to have a mixed audience, and that's something where then you have a, and then the possibility for those works Absolutely. to be read differently emerges. You do, but we all know that these spaces, just like the ca academic spaces and the artistic uh, spaces, are very white spaces. And uh, and that people, not everybody, enter these spaces. And I think when you change the narrative of those spaces, when you invite artists that come and bring a different narrative and a different aesthetic, mm -hmm. and are doing undoing the the common practices, mm -hmm. the common choreographies, the common aesthetics, then I think a lot of people. Uh, who live in the city and do not never enter those spaces, then suddenly start visiting. And I think this is the, I, I think this is for me when it's useful, um, that you really see that makes a lot of sense because you really be can touch people mm. and you really, it can then the work can really become transformative. Um, I don't think that happens very much in the academia because you are in a dialogue with a system. Um, with a system who already excluded the majority of people who cannot even enter the academia. So uh, you cannot have this direct dialogue uh, with a lot of people. But I think if you all enter to open spaces where you don't have to matriculate yourself and go through an exam and <laughs> make a German uh, language uh, <laughs> <laughs> exam and be a, a super intelligent, whatever, to go to enter the university, super intelligent, but not knowing what the Berlin conference was anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, these contradictions in which we live. Um, I think a lot of people are excluded from the spaces, even if you are lecturing and bringing mm -hmm. your knowledge there. But uh, that's why I believe more in open spaces. That's why I think it's great to do this work here, 
I really enjoy to do this work here at the Gorky Theatre Studio, yeah, because it's an alternative space where these segmentations mm -hmm. are not there. You can, you have this freedom of producing knowledge. And I think that's what arts do. You can do something and you have the right to fail. And um, in the science, you don't have the right to fail. You cannot fail. You have to do it right. And that makes it extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to ask, does anybody I'm have a question or I'm a comment? I'm checking the time for us. And there's a microphone out there somewhere. Uh -huh, here we go. Hi. Uh, um, thank you for being here and um, blowing my mind. Um, <laughs> I have a question. A lot of, I have a lot of questions, but this is, um, I think, the most important. Um, you said that um, open spaces are are more open, and that might be true, but um, this is also supposed to be an open space, and um, um, I think these, this, these spaces are also selective, and, um, and I don't know, um, um, it might be, it might be, more open than the university, but it's still not open enough for PUCs, black PUC. Um, yeah, this is what I want. It, it wasn't a question, it was more like a <laughs> comment to say that um, <laughs> open spaces are not so open. No, they are not. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Do, is somebody else have a comment? Diana, collect you collect. Yeah, there we have up here in the front, and then yeah, let's collect a couple, but and then. Yeah, I just <coughs> my comment went in the same direction. Like I was thinking just today, I uh, um, uh, I read about the that D Jim also had I think one black person in her. Um, uh, part of the government and like when you think about the social inequality um, along race lines in Brazil um, it is also extremely um, uh, it like it, it points it uh, comes to so my English is absent right now but um, it like it, it's clear um, how um, spaces are segregated and uh, on the streets, on on like every possible. I mean, for, uh, foremost, like Sao Paulo is is it's and 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 David Abuera and like who who enters that park, who enters those spaces, who knows uh, in the favelas where um, where that 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 the Biennale is. is uh, opening, who, is, uh, who has the time to go there, who has the means to go there. Like, I'm not saying, I'm not taking your comment at face value, but um, like, it is very, like, I don't know, I was thinking maybe if you go uh, to say what you're saying and what, you, and what your work says um, in other spaces that are non-academic and non-like white cube artistic, I think uh, people would also get reached and, and they would understand uh, what, you, what you're what you saying. Thank you for yeah. that. And let's, let's maybe we move on. So let's, let's can, can we just, can you show me the hands and get your, there's one here. Does anyone else have a question? There's, okay, we do you and then you in the back in the white shirt, right? You in the purple yeah, shirt yeah. and you in the white shirt, okay? Okay, just a very short, uh, short comment to contradict you. I don't think that you're, that you can fail in the art world. You, you cannot fail in the art world. You're not allowed to fail, otherwise you're out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in the very back on the left side, there's a white t-shirt. Can you show? Hello. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, um, first. And a very quick question. 
Um, so you're talking about decolonizing formats of knowledge production. And I wondered about, do you think your pieces could um, decolonize formats of art production? Mm. Because what I saw seems quite familiar to um, what we could expect in such a Biennale anywhere uh, up north in Occident or in Paris or whatever. So what would be uh, decolonized art formats of art production? I, I, I think uh, that's a very good question. I, I think that's, I think, I even thought we already answered to it. I think, for instance, in this project, which is a very experimental project where you're really contradicting and, and inverting uh, the formats of the video installation, for instance, for all the things I said from the digital and technical aspect of it, where you suddenly, where you usually have faces and bodies and you instead of have words um, and instead of, and the narrative goes through a different narrative, which is the sound narrative, which uh, is also something that we didn't talk about it, but it's very, very um, fascinating, I think, that if you go to certain countries and certain or in for many of us growing up in certain communities and cultures, there's, there's a element of sound that surrounds us, uh, that we grew up with that sound. For instance, there's always a drumming. Um, there's, there's, uh, the singing comes very easily. The, 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 the environment is physically um, uh, fooled with, with, with sound. The sound, the drumming, the music, the speaking is very, very strong. And I wanted to play with that, with that, that um, you can speak and na narrate a story uh, without having necessarily to tell it word by word, but you feel it through the drumming. And this is, I think, very much a culture of knowledge production and of narrative that comes very much, for instance, from the African communities. And that went through the diasporas, if you go to Brazil, to Cuba, um, to South Africa, to Ghana, to Nigeria, to Angola, Santo Mary Príncipe, there's music, you're always listening to music. If you go to the communities here in Berlin, we always have music playing, we have thousands of instruments at home, um, my children are playing, uh, there's, there's always this element, and I find that very fascinating, this um, embodying the space, the physical space with sound, and this is very much what, for instance, is in this ex experimental uh, project I was uh, trying to, to bring. And this is already uh, very much done bringing this, this contradiction of the technological and, uh, and because the music, unfortunately, it is a pity that we, s I don't know why we have such a bad sound today, um, but the music, the drumming is a very strong drumming that we, turn it electronic a little bit, so we play with this. And you're really contradicting the usual practices of artistic practices. And I think this is when you bring your elements into that. And I think this is when you start decolonizing knowledge, when you, uh, when you cross these um, borders that have always been there, how it has to be done, and suddenly you bring a different narrative. Um, and I think this is very much what this project, but many other projects that were there, were doing, exactly are trying to undo this. Yeah. But, but I do have to say, I think maybe what's important to keep in mind is actually one of the comments that was raised by you, but that was uh, heard during the documentation, is that mostly images of marginalized people tend to go through this kind of loss and despair. We could also go further with exoticism or even folkloristic images. And so then I think like these are things where it's not just that it's basically taking topics that are usually done by basically having a view, which even by a black artist for another black artist is always about representing authentic body and authentic subject, which then still is disempowered Absolutely. through this kind of other process of viewing and the gaze and so on. And a learned gaze and a gaze that is no matter who is viewing is still educated within a very white like established culture. And so that this, by using just these words and this, the, like the black and white of the of the text as a video, 
and not re- like not going through bodies and faces and voices, mm. this and still allowing this other sound to evoke to to have something that's evocative, but without being personal and without mm. be, without having even the moment of risk of exotic exoticizing or falling into this trap of of having a marginalized voice. It's again just this kind of misery misery. So there's no and there's no moment where there's empowerment possible mm. in this other form and like of. Of documentary, but, uh, but so. I think this is very much this decolonizing knowledge. I find it, for instance, very interesting. I I was very lucky to meet the, for instance, Lyle Ashton Aries, who's one of my very dear favorite artists, and who I think when I started teaching at university, lecturing, I I presented his work mm, every semester, and he's one of the first black queer. Um, artists, intellectuals uh, from New York, where he was really contradicting the narratives and playing with these images of colonization and the body and undoing these two gender um, uh, constructions. Um, He was bringing so many different elements at the same time. It was really irritating for a lot of spaces to have his knowledge uh, uh, there because it goes beyond what is expected. And it, I, I think that's exactly that moment when we come to these spaces and we bring a new narrative and aesthetic, you're really undoing this usual uh, pattern. Uh, there was another artist that I find absolutely fascinating, a Brazilian artist, uh, Dalton Paula, who was presenting, was one of the few uh, Afro-Brazilian artists presenting his work. And he do it his paintings in dozens of bowls um, of ceramic, and these bowls were usually prepared, are usually used to prepare food to the African uh, gods. And then he occupied a huge space as big as this room, only with these bowls of ceramic and um, with his paintings. And People were not focused on the paintings themselves, and each painting had a story to tell. People were f- disturbed that these bowls, which are very symbolic of the African uh, culture, were in the wrong space. And that's when you really, you really are decolonizing the spaces by bringing them. And I think this is a good moment to come to these other uh, two questions that I think these spaces, many of these spaces, are dominant spaces, of course, and I think it will be, they will be still for a long time, but it is a process that I think we have to initiate through our work. And I think as more as we bring our work and new, this is what we're doing in Cosmos Square, bringing new artists, refugee artists, that uh, bring knowledge here to these spaces that could never be seen, there w- there's no transfer, they cannot be seen, they cannot become visible. That's actually when we start transforming um, the audience inside the spaces. And of course, it is a process, it is not immediate. And we work, of course, at the periphery and we work with communities. But for me, both are very important. I think it's very important to work with the communities and to work in, at the periphery um, and work with uh, one by one by transforming and empowering. But I think it is also very important to come to the center and to come to these very huge spaces that historically own us immensely um, and that we bring our agendas to these spaces. So both are very necessary. And then is the choice of the audience if they want to come or not. Um, and they come. And they're learning to also to come. I think this is also a process that we learn. We start learning that we can enter certain spaces and that we can stay. And I think this is really a process of undoing 500 years of history. Um, and this I think this is what many of us are doing. And it's very important. And it's very important to have this positive vision because this is indeed very transformative. Yeah, I do have to say a little, a minor defensive. 
for basically all the POCs that are in universities. <laughs> I have to say, stay in. <laughs> yes, absolutely, but, stay but, in. <laughs> but, no, it's, it's really a <laughs> struggle for everybody that does stay in and that has to deal with absolutely. being usually the only one in some department somewhere. Like, And then talking about professors and so on. And for the students in the spaces, I mean, it's kind of an old joke of us, Edgar Schoss and Panko. You know, so it's it's like no, one uh, stay in absolutely. Yeah. You have to stay in, but it's it's necessary to be active in a lot of spaces. And I'm only guessing from here and in the lighting that you look younger than I am. And I'm <laughs> going to say I think it's it's your task to make actually to create spaces and to sort of take this knowledge and produce further and and create spaces. And I think like, when we speak about favelas, it's like actually producing knowledge and producing culture takes a certain amount of resources. And this is something where it's like, I think it's not up to one Biennale or one artist to solve the social conditions of Brazil. No, but I think it's a process. It's yeah. I think it's really a process that maybe five years ago didn't, ha didn't yeah. take place. I mean, we are here uh, at the uh, Studio Ya, yeah, and mm -hmm. it's the first time that we're doing a Cosmo Square. Um, and we didn't do it five years ago or ten years yeah. ago, and we knew already the the history of uh, Alexander von Humboldt. So <laughs> I think when certain people come to power positions, they also decide to change the agendas and and to bring new narratives. And I think this is really very important. Right. You know what? I think just because of time, maybe we should move to the last, last one, three films. Yeah. So can we can we go to the last film, which is? While I write, from the Desire Project. I don't have a clock. Can I just get a sign? How are we doing on time? Five to ten. Five to ten? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing, because I think even through these different um, 
relationships, the questions and comments that come out of the work. I think it's important for you and your work and your practice that you are in Sao Paulo. And it's important, like all of these things that you've been doing have led up to you creating this desire project and the upcoming illusions, right? right. But yeah. maybe what's interesting is that you got such incredible uh, crit critiques from the, the work. And that it's, uh, I've seen it in Portuguese, Spanish, and English, that it was so actually, the, the uh, desire project was often noted by critics at the whole Biennale that it was one of the most powerful pieces there. So congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> and I think one of the things that the people are referring to is exactly this mix of like basically contemporary technology and maybe like with the man in the white shirt at the back. So this, these in a way familiar video installation, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, some things are very familiar in that, but also this mix with the, with the uh, altar and with the four and the three channel video installation, that these things, because then you have things like smells inter interfere, so that what it means to enter a space and see these works and hear these mm. uh, drumming things ha takes, you know, gives you a different experience of the work, but also compared to many works in the, in the Biennale, it was apparently very, very strong, a very strong experience for many people. So, well done. Thank and you, thank you. That was quite amazing to then, uh, one day or two days later, uh, I think I was flying back when I started receiving um, the reviews, and uh, it's quite amazing to see how, 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 how beautiful the critics were, and, 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 um, and how the audience and the, and the, and the press uh, wrote about it as, as, as such as one of the strongest pieces there. I was very surprised and uh, very happy to hear that, which just, I think it goes really to the very beginning of our conversation, how important it is to risk mm -hmm. and to undo the usual practices. And I think then, I think when we risk and expose ourselves to that much, mm -hmm. then sometimes surprisingly, uh, comes such reaction. I, I was really very happy, uh, extremely happy uh, to to read all that, and I was not expecting as well. So it's yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, you know, I I wanted to go back to this comment maybe that we didn't really address, which was the point of that you cannot fail as an artist, which I think the difference is that <laughs> a sort of scientific test that needs a proof versus failure as an artist, because in the experimentation of an artist like th through this, you don't have to recreate the same thing. So did, I guess we're looking at failure as a word a little bit differently. <laughs> but here, yeah. because of taking these risks and, and going forward and like... I think you can fail. I, I, I really think um, it's one of the few s places that do not have um, the, the vision or the intention of a universal truth mm -hmm. and of an objective truth and of a neutral truth. And that already permits uh, failures and permits, um, permits to experiment and to try new formats. Mm -hmm. That's also uh, why I think many of us then really try to create a very hybrid, spa uh, hybrid work uh, that can cross all these different disciplines. And if I look back to the people who have inspired me most, that's what, how mm -hmm. they have been working, uh, where you really have difficulties to place the work in one single yeah. discipline. And, um, and uh, it's crossing the borders. And I, I think this is a way of decolonizing knowledge and creating these, these very urgent narratives. And in that sense, you are allowed to fail, in my yeah. opinion. Um, you just do what you want to do, and then people feel touched or not, mm -hmm. or can identify or em empathize with the narrative or not. And um, but you don't have the ob the goal of creating something universal that speaks to everybody. You're speaking to yourself with the hope that many others can identify with, and by doing so, they can transform themselves. That's that's what I do the work for. You know, I think that's a really wonderful place to end this conversation. Thanks. I do. Diana. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you. So, but I do have to say that be, to talk about this question of going other spaces, 
that um, Grada, one of the guests that was seen in the in the video, Bino, runs um, with a few of his colleagues. I think it might be the only mostly African-run radio studio in the on the European continent in Valdemarstrasse. Grada in Kreuzberg. <laughs> 46. And we are working together with uh, Kati FM, so we are born free. Empowerment Radio, which is run by Bino, and Reboot FM are partners with other groups doing Kati FM. And Grada will be our guest next week. And then we have a tiny room which fits about 20 people, but <laughs> with a capacity to uh, reach thousands in the radio. So that's when, like, we, we look for different ways to reach people. So that's, that's how where we will continue. It's yes, we, this discussion will be continued, and Grada will, of course, continue with the Cosmos <laughs> series here. Thank and you so much, Diana. Thank you. And thank you to the thank audience. Thank you. <laughs> 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 thank you. I'm going to steal the cotton. Yeah.